at stramme op og rette ryggen. Well, because well, everyone needs to be encouraged to mature, let's say, or at least they need to be not discouraged in their attempts to mature. And I would say that as we've more and more wholeheartedly adopted the um, appalling idea that our culture is essentially a patriarchal tyranny, that men's striving forward to become competent and responsible has become mixed in, a, in, a, in an unhelpful manner with the striving towards power that s- s- theoretically signifies this patriarchal domination. And so that means that men aren't being asked to take their place like they should be or encouraged to. In fact, they're often discouraged from and punished for, and that's not useful. And so just to make clear what you're already saying, but what I think may have been misunderstood sometimes, you're talking about empowerment in psychological terms rather than political terms. So when you speak about power or becoming strong, you don't talk about sort of gaining power over others so much as gaining power individually. There's no power in gaining power over others. That's an illusion, and and it's a fragile illusion at that. I mean, you can act the tyrant, but the probability that that's going to work out well for you or anyone else, unless you're aiming at destruction and misery, and you might be, the probability that that's going to be a strategy that's going to be effective is extraordinarily, it's, it's zero. It doesn't work. If you're not shocked by that finding, then you, you're either not awake or you don't understand it. So that's the first thing. And the second thing is that it's not an artifact of the bias of the researchers. Because researchers, psychological researchers, were dumbfounded when this, when this effect first started to manifest itself. Because the general consensus among social scientists who tend to believe in sociocultural determination more than biological determination, not all of them, but that's the general tendency, was that as societies became more equal, that men and women would become more alike because of of the socialization similarities. But that's not what happened. The difference is maximized. And so, and and the, the effects are quite large. Now, men and women are still more similar than they are different, but they're quite different. They're certainly different enough to produce as a consequence of the free choice of men and women, quite radical differences in the distribution of people in different occupational categories. Engineering, that's a good example. Men tend to be more interested in people or in things, and women tend to be more interested in people. So you get a disproportionate number of male engineers and a disproportionate number of female nurses. And the tendency is to attribute that to differences in socialization, but it doesn't seem to be accurate. And then there's an absolutely revolutionary consequence of this, which has, what would you say, large-scale political ramifications that the Scandinavians are going to have to deal with first. And that is that you cannot simultaneously produce maximal choice and, and freedom of opportunity, equality of opportunity, and equal outcomes across occupational choice, for example, perhaps not even across pay. You cannot do both of those simultaneously. So if you choose equality of outcome, if you insist that every occupational category is is characterized by a distribution of people that matches the population for gender and race and so forth, then you're going to interfere substantially with equality of opportunity because you're going to end up forcing your citizenry down choice pathways that they would not make as free agents. And so that's a big problem, and you people are in particular stuck with it. It's on us. In order to solve that, we have to figure out how, what to attribute it to. So why is this? What's your theory on this? Well, I wouldn't say it's a theory. I think we know. And it's actually quite straightforward in some sense. You could imagine that there are two sources of variation in the differences between men and women. There's natural variation, biological, and there's sociocultural variation. If you eliminate the sociocultural variation by flattening out the, the society, then you, you maximize the biological diversity. That's the consequence. And so it seems obvious in some sense in retrospect, but people weren't conceptualizing it that way to begin with. And so then the question is, well, what do you do about it? And um, I would say that you don't increase the degree of totalitarian insistence that everyone acts exactly the same so that the outcomes are identical because you'll, the, co- 
the cure will be far worse than the disease under those circumstances. Now, um, of course, as you just uh, explained it, this, of course, is the obvious uh, thought, or not obvious, but a logical thought, mm -hmm. that if it's not culture, then it's biology. And uh, I was so fascinated by this finding uh, that we uh, contacted one of the authors of the science study, uh, Dr. Johannes Hermle. He's a, a PhD student at Berkeley. And uh, we asked him what he thought could be concluded from these findings. And I'll just show you what he said. Sure. Consider, for example, the abundance of materialistic consumption choices which we are offered in developed countries every day. These choices can be particularly gendered or it be marketed to us uh, in a particularly gendered way and con consequently induce gender-specific uh, social roles or expectations in the ways we have to behave. Given this, the connection between gender equality, economic development on one hand, and gender-specific social roles on the other hand is much more complex. Therefore, our results do not rule out social roles as a driver of gender differences and preferences, and instead they can be accommodated by both theories, either basing gender differences and preferences on social roles, but also biology or evolutionary determinants, or even in combination of both social roles and biology. A conclusion that our results can only be explained based on biology or ex uh, evolution in this regard is too simplistic. So what do you think about this? He says it's very possible that it's biology, but it's probably not all biology. Well, it's at least a good thing that he says that it's probable that it's partly biology because that's a good start. I mean, co social roles, including gender roles, are multiply determined and they're certainly affected by education. The problem with the social role theory is that it doesn't account for why the differences increase as your society becomes more gender equal. See, unless there's something wrong with your theory of gender equality, like if this is a sociological phenomenon and there's something sociological that's driving men and women apart in terms of their preferences and temperament, then we have the theory about what's necessary in order to equalize the playing field between men and women wrong and all the social policies that have been put in place to ensure equality of opportunity, let's say, are somehow formulated improperly. Now, that's possible, but it, but I don't, uh, like, there isn't anyone who has an accounting for that. Now, you could say that along with the gender equality sociopolitical provisions, there's been a rise in consumer pressure on children or something like that, uh, or uh, a counter position maybe in the schools that have produced gendered, more gendered behavior in a, in, a, in a manner that we don't understand that stemmed from the gender neutral social policies, but no one has a coherent accounting of that. And it strikes me as, as such an improbable hypothesis that, that, because I can't see, I mean, is it possible that as we've made countries admittedly more gender neutral, that they've actually become less gender neutral? Well, if that's the case, then all our notions about what, how to treat boys and girls with any degree of reasonable equivalence, all of that has to be thrown out. It's possible, but no one has a coherent account of that. So just to uh, at least make a status for now in Scandinavia, I guess there's a, a possibility that we have actually done something very right. We've created equality of possibilities and we've allowed people to make their free choices from that. That sounds pretty good. Well, we could, we could conclude on that, you know, and that's really something. It might be that we're all best served if equality of opportunity is maximized so that we all have optimal access to the greatest possible pool of talent and then we let the cards fall where they will. But there's going to be consequences to that. There's going to be consequences in terms of income inequality. And there's going to be consequences in terms of occupational choice. Now, those things are tied together. Like one of the things that happens is that men tend to choose occupations that are, well, they're more dangerous. They tend to work outside more. They tend to move more for their occupational choice. But they also tend to concentrate on disciplines that are thing-oriented, like the STEM fields. And often your economic activity in those domains is scalable. So you can make more money. And so 
it, we don't know how to we don't know how to have both worlds simultaneously. And I would say, as you pointed out, that a good consequence, and as good as we can manage now, is to let people make their choice and not to push too hard on them to maximize some hypothetically desirable equality of opportunity. You know, you see in Scandinavia increasing pressure to raise boys and girls in a gender-neutral manner. Perhaps that'll address the persistent inequality of outcome. It's like, first of all, we don't know how to do that. Second, if you look at the behavior, because there have been studies of this sort, of people who claim to raise their children in a gender-neutral manner, they're just as gendered in their interactions with their children as other people, because most of that is unconscious behavior, it's habitual behavior, or maybe it's deeply rooted biological behavior. And third, it doesn't seem to me to be particularly wise to perform a large-scale social experiment on thousands and thousands of children in the pursuit of an end that might not be possible or desirable in any case. All right. Um, things to think about in Scandinavia, certainly. Now, um, I want to go back to some of the... How, the problems that this book provides an answer for because um, I saw you on the Swedish talk show Skavland the other day and I heard you say that really life has never been better than it is now. We have it good and we have it because of many improvements uh, made over time. Um, now I guess I, I, um, that made me wonder if some of these improvements have been brought on by the very elements in modern life that you also, if not criticize, then point to as challenges, really the chaos of newness, democratization, gender equality, all of this, which this book provides an antidote to, but well, can you no, separate the there's two? There's no doubt that... that all sorts of progress has been made economically as a consequence of the emancipation of women. I mean, if you look worldwide, the best predictor of the likelihood of positive economic development among developing countries is their treatment of women. That's the best single predictor. And if women possess approximately 50% of the talent and you have that locked up so that it can't be utilized, then you, you've deprived yourself and everyone else of the talent of 50% of your population. And the increasing ability for people of different types, let's say, there's many different types, to, to, to manifest their talents in a, in a fair environment, that's obviously been of tremendous utility to everyone. And the left wing has played its role in that, and the right wing has played its role in that, and that's part of the dynamic of, of successful democratic politics. So I don't have a problem with, with any of that, and it's certainly the case that newness and creativity and, and fresh ideas and all of that, well, they're the primary drivers of entrepreneurial, um, what would you call it, entrepreneurial and creative originality. Which, and, I guess, is why I wonder why you need an antidote for it. Well, anything in excess is pathological. So too much, there's chaos, and a leaven of chaos is, well, that's what makes life exciting, right? You don't want your day to be entirely predictable. You want exactly the right amount of chaos to be introduced to it as a consequence of your voluntary choice. And so the antidote to chaos isn't order. The antidote to chaos, and it, the book never claims, not once, that the antidote to chaos is order. The antidote to chaos is the balance between chaos and order. And that manifests itself in the instinct for meaning. So for example, and this is a deep, I believe, a deep biological truth. When you find yourself deeply engaged in something so that your attention is captured and time passes without you noticing, self-consciousness disappears. It's because you're, 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 you're the recipient of a signal from deep within you that you're in a place where you're ordered enough to be secure, but you're, you're tapping into enough chaos so that you're learning and being renewed. And that's where you want to be. And if you adopt responsibility properly and you discipline yourself properly and then you face the challenges of the world courageously, then that's where you'll put yourself. And that's the antidote. Not order, because order can degenerate, can and does degenerate into tyranny. That's its problem. So, you know, chaos degenerates into nihilism and hopelessness, but order degenerates into tyranny. I think you've already answered a lot of this uh, because uh, 
I uh, was kind of looking across the world as I do in this program, which is a news perspective program. And across the world, we see strongmen uh, gaining power in Europe. We see Viktor yes, Orban. A, a word we should never use for them. Oh, really? Strong men. Oh, it's it's too close to what we'd like for for men. It's too it's too uh, it's too yeah it's it's too complimentary. So to be a tyrant is not to be strong. So what's the right, better be, word? How about dictator? Dictators are people at least challenging democratic principles and suggesting... And dictator wannabes. The dictator wannabes mm. of the world. Um, I, w I just wonder, do you see that too? I mean, might there be a new book saying what is the antidote to this um, perverse longing for a tyrannical order? Yes, well, I would say there is a fair bit of that in 12 Rules for Life, but there's probably even more of that in my first book, in Maps of Meaning and in my lectures. I mean, I've been talking about the dangers of tyranny for three decades, and so I have dozens of lectures online that are specifically devoted to that, detailing out the horrors of the, well, of the Soviet authoritarian state and also of the Nazi authoritarian state. And so... As I said already, order isn't the antidote to chaos. It's the balance that's mm -hmm. the antidote. And the dangers of order are just as prevalent as the dangers of chaos. I mean, you can become too rigid and expire that way, or you can become too dissolute and expire that way. It's, it's a matter of striking the appropriate balance. I guess they just meet in interesting ways. I was thinking about a contemporary example, which uh, might be uh, the discipline of gender studies, which you've criticized harshly. Um, yes, I criticize it on the grounds that I don't really regard it as a discipline. As an academic discipline mm -hmm. in itself. Mm -hmm. So now uh, Hungary's uh, yes. leader mm -hmm. decided to prohibit yes. gender studies as such. Yes. So which is worse? Is it worse to have a discipline that's not really a discipline? Or is it worse to have a government that interferes in what courses are allowed to be yeah, taught in university? Yeah, it's not good. It's not good. I mean, the thing is, you don't want to open the door to, to, to political interference in the autonomy of the universities. Now, it's tricky because at the same time, I don't believe that it's reasonable for political activists to be subsidized by the, by the public purse. And I think it's incumbent on universities to draw a distinction between education and activism. Charities have to do that in order to remain registered. But that but doesn't I make it right for the government. To no, it. it's a huge danger because, well, first of all, even let's say that you lean to the right. And so you want to impose a right wing viewpoint on the universities. Well, your society isn't going to lean to the right forever in all likelihood and so if you open the door to that kind of political interference, then it's going to be used by people all over the spectrum. It's going to deprive the universities of their necessary autonomy. And that's a big problem. You know, we need in a society, this is part of the necessity for checks and balances, is we need a variety of autonomous institutions. And the whole point of tenure was to ensure the autonomy of the individual lecturer, the individual educator, and to eradicate a discipline by fiat is to interfere with the principle of the autonomy of the university. And even if, for example, I'm not a fan of that particular discipline, I don't believe that that's an appropriate way of dealing with it. I think my preference would be to deprive those disciplines of their market by providing a better alternative, a better story. And that's a, that's a longer lasting um, way of dealing with the, with the problem in any case. Thank you very much, Dr. Peterson. Thanks very much for the invitation.